That's the first verse up on the screen. And um, if you, I mean, I'm sure you know kind of how I work. We're going to go through all the Bible. We're going to go from Genesis to Revelation. And um, for time's sake, because I, I always put up more verses than what I think I can get through. I have a fear of preaching in front of people and not having enough verses to preach about. So uh, I have a lot. So for time's sake, I may not necessarily wait for you to turn to all these places. I'd like for you to try to keep up if you can. Some people like to take notes, and I think that's a good idea. Write things down. Write things down in your Bible, things that you learn, things that uh, maybe you've never heard before. Jot them down in your, in your Bible. Make a little note of that in a notebook, and uh, we'll follow along. Um, I don't know if I should tell you what brought this to my mind. I don't know if I should tell you just yet. I might spook you out of here. But I mentioned last night, if you had a machine that you put your hands on it, and it displayed up on a screen the future. Let's say that, Gary, I'll, I'll pick on you. Anybody sits up front, I'm going to nail them, all right? So, Gary, let's say that you, you had a machine. And you put your hands on it. And up on the screen... It showed you events that were going to take place next week. Lottery ticket, right? So you put your hands on the little deal and up on the screen it projected a future event and it showed you next week's winning lottery numbers. What are you going to do? Buy a ticket. How many tickets? How many tickets do you need? I only need one. Just need one. Because you saw the winning numbers. You go and buy that. All you got to do is spend a dollar, right? So lo and behold, the next week comes. You got $30 million now. Okay? Remember the people in Kenya. That's all I'm going to say. Okay? So keep that in mind. So you keep doing that. You think $30 million is not enough. So you put your hands on there again, and it shows you that you could win $50 million. So you go buy another ticket. There it goes. So then you say, you know what? I'm going to Vegas with this thing. So you go to Las Vegas. Lost wages, right? And you go there, and let's say, if you were going to play a game, what would you play in Vegas? What would you play? Just pick one. Poker, you're a poker guy, okay? So let's say that you're going to play poker. So you put your hands on there, and up on the screen is you playing a game of poker with a bunch of guys at a table, and you're able to see all of their cards and every hand that they play. And so you figured, when I do this thing, because this machine's been right all this time, when I do this thing, I'm going to put it all down. All that, you got $80 million now you want in the lottery. You're going to go lay $80 million down on the table. That's high stakes poker. That's where they, they pay for your room. You don't, okay? Because you're a high roller. And because they figure they're going to get 80 mil out of you. So you put it all on the table because you've seen in advance everybody's cards. And even, you know, think about poker, you could have the worst hand in the world, but you bluff those guys and they're going to fold and you're going to win even though you had nothing that's part of the strategy of poker so that's what you do okay now does gary win that last poker game that's the question does he win he wins every poker game up until the end and he puts all the money down on the table and he's seen the machine now that's showed him the future, and he believes that that machine's going to tell him the future. But he lost that last game. The machine was wrong. One time. Okay? Now, believe it or not, you know how the internet is full of 
stuff. That, what I just told you, that scenario is out there, not the poker thing. The idea of a machine that could foretell the future. Now, is that just so out of sorts with reality that nothing like that could ever happen? Well, let's read our Bible. Think Bible. Is that scenario so completely out of reality that it could never, ever be true? Not according to the scriptures. Not according to the scriptures. And I'll show it to you. First of all, Amos chapter 3, verse 7. One of my favorite verses. Surely the Lord God will do nothing. But he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Uh, I can't remember who it was I was talking to yesterday. And they brought up something. They asked me a question out of the Bible. And I, I said, well, the Bible doesn't really tell us. Oh, they asked me about the Urim and the Thummim. From the Old Testament. They used some sort of mechanism in the Old Testament and God ordained this. This was from God. They had what was called the Urim and the Thummim. It was somehow attached to the breastplate that Aaron, the high priest, wore. And basically, it either said yes or no. That's what it did. They would ask God a question. And the answer would either come yes or no. And it was basically a very simple way of understanding what God wanted. Now, do we have any, what was that? The question is, what was that? The answer is, nobody knows. I mean, I learned about this in Bible college. And I remember the Bible college lecture and the Bible college uh, professor basically he said, we don't know what it was. There are certain theories, and I read the Wikipedia article the other day. You know, a Wikipedia article sounded like my professor in Bible college. There's theories. We don't know what it was. We have no idea. We don't have a picture of it. God didn't give a description of it. And my point is this. Since God didn't put it in the Bible exactly what it was, it doesn't matter. Move on to something else. Amen. Don't worry about what God didn't say in his word. He's telling you, worry about what I did say in Scripture. And the Internet is full of arguments from people about, well, this is in the Bible, but, you know, d did it really mean this? Or does it mean possibly this? Or could it be this? And I think it was this way. And they base a whole understanding of prophecy upon something that's not even there. But they want you to think it is. And they want you to think that they figured it out. But if it's not there, God's saying, it ain't there, move on. Think about what is there. I've asked this question multiple times to people. Show me seven years of tribulation in the Bible. I've asked people, show it to me. Show me the verses. I need two, I'll take three. I might even be satisfied with one, but I need two to base a doctrine on it. Out of two witnesses or three, let every word be established. To show me seven years of what the Bible calls tribulation. And yet, there are whole doctrines built upon that idea as if it is as rock solid as the Bible's description of the crucifixion. And I've never seen it. I used to think it was there. I used to believe it was there. But I don't read it. I don't see it. And if I don't see it, I have to ask, is it true? Some say, well, that's the 70 weeks of Daniel. That's the 70 what of Daniel? Weeks? How long is a week in Minnesota? How long is a week in Arkansas? He had to think about it for a while. But he got it. To me, a week is a week. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret and the service of the prophets. So here's what I believe. I believe that everything that God is going to do, everything that God has done in your life has come right out of this Bible, has it not? And the joy is finding yourself in this book, finding your story in this Bible. That's amazing. Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, 
The mystery of God, we talked about that last night, the mystery of God should be finished. As he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And you might ask, so what is the mystery of God here in Revelation 10, 7? Well, read Mark chapter 4. Read Romans. Read 1 Corinthians 15. Read um, 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Read Revelation 17. Every place you find the word mystery, it's going to tell you what the mystery of God is. It'll reveal it to you so you'll know this is what God is doing at this point right here. And he said it as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, I'm going to move through some verses here uh, kind of fast because I want to get to where I'm going with this. But some, you know, you have some people that say, Oh, I went to church last night and boy, I got the Holy Ghost in me. Ooh, and I started dancing and I started speaking in tongues and I started gyrating all over the floor and I fell backward and got slain in the spirit. Oh, I was so full of the Holy Spirit. And yet, is that the evidence that you're full of the Holy Spirit? What is the evidence? Second Peter, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Better than Gary, than your machine. Better than your machine. Because as I explained last night, if I were to tell you that there's a magic book that when you open it up, it tells you your future and your future is you could have a, a lifetime, an immortality lifetime full of riches. Well, that's what this is. Only it's not magic, it's God's power. And this book has never been wrong, ever, and it never will be. You can count on it. Better than Gary's busted up machine, amen? You're, you're, you're my, uh, I'm going to pick on you all day. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter said that in relation to, he said, I was there on the mountain when I heard God say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Peter said, I heard that voice. So I know that God said that Jesus was God's only begotten son in whom he was well pleased. But he said, you've got something better than me telling you this. You have the Bible. You have a more sure word of prophecy. And you do well that you'll take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until when? The day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What that means is the day we get resurrected, we will not be carrying Bibles no more. Amen. Amen. We'll have them in our heart. We'll know it. 2 Peter 1, look at the evidence. Look what happens when the Holy Ghost falls on someone. 2 Peter 1, 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, now that's dual meaning of that, number one, private translation, the translators of the King James, when they were working on their translation, they knew, number one, to share their work with the group. So that, and this was King James' orders. He didn't want the Church of England to boss around the Puritan scholars. He didn't want the Puritan scholars to boss around the Anglican scholars. He said, I want you to work together. And make sure that it's not an Anglican Bible. Make sure it's not a Puritan Bible. Make sure it's God's Bible. That was King James that said that. Amen. So that's what they did. They made sure that no one person put in their opinion over how it should be translated. Then they, they checked their translation against Luther's German Bible, the Latin Bible, the earlier English translations of the Bible, any other vernacular translation of the Bible, they check their translation against it. Because if God's going to say it in English, he's going to say it in Latin. He's going to say it in, in German. He's going to say it in Italian. He's going to say it in French. He's going to say it to everybody the same way. And that's what they did. So no private interpretation. But it also means that you don't get to look at a verse and say, well, I say that this verse means this. Nobody can do that. Not a scholar, not a doctor, not somebody running a prophecy conference in Festus, Missouri. Nobody can do that. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Amen? Amen. But then he said, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by who? So when the Holy Ghost fell on Jeremiah, what did, Jer what did it cause Jeremiah to do? Speak. 
Ephesians 3, 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So when the Spirit fell on the holy apostles, what did they do? Speak. They spoke. They wrote words down. That's what they did. I got more. 2 Samuel 23, 2, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. So the Spirit is where the Bible came from. Isaiah 61, 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. We know Jesus read this in the synagogue when they handed him the book and he opened the book and he read this verse. So when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, what did it cause him to do? Preach. Cause him to speak to his people in the language that they understood. Ezekiel eleven five. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, What? Speak. Thus saith the Lord. Matthew ten nineteen. But when they deli listen to this, because this is getting into prophecy time here. Turn to Matthew ten. I always tell you, walk circumspectly. Circum means circle. Specti I have spectacles on my face. It means look around. So when you're reading the Bible, somebody gives you a verse out of the Bible or a piece of a verse out of the Bible. If somebody just gives me a piece of a verse out of the Bible, I kind of suspect they're hiding something. Or they're going to try to twist what it's really saying. So get a verse, look it up, find out what comes before, like find out what comes after, find out where that verse is. When they deliver you up, listen to what Jesus is saying. Not if they deliver you up, but when they deliver you up. Who in here would be scared if soldiers came marching in this church with guns, lining everybody up against the wall? I would. Some of you guys have gone, no, nah, I shoot them. I kill them. I shoot them. But that could happen. When they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it will be given you in that same hour what you've... How, let me ask, how many of you have ever had a situation where you were talking to somebody, didn't know the words, and all of a sudden, boom, they were right there? You ever had that? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Because you get done and you look back and you're going, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. For it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And that ought to just make you melt in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. When the Holy Ghost falls on you in that hour, you're not going to dance, laugh on the floor, puke. You're not going to vomit green stuff on everybody. Your head's not going to spin around. You're going to speak what God said. Amen? And they're going to go... Mm. That's when they'll get mad and kill you. All right? So don't worry about it. John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Notice this. I love this. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So, and Jesus was teaching Nicodemus what the phrase born again means. And he said, you must be born again. Nicodemus, how is that possible that I, that I can't be born you know, my mother's womb again. He said, no, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he used the phrase born again twice in this chapter, and the only other time it's in the Bible is in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So he says in, in John, being born again of the spirit, he says in Peter that you're born again of the word, but which is true? Both of them. You're not just born again of the Spirit of God. You're born again of the Word of God as well. So that must mean that the Spirit of God and the Word of God are the same. Amen? To my knowledge, I only had one father. Right? Right, Mom? Just one daddy. That's all I had. It's the same with God. Born of one Father, one Spirit, and one Word. And these three are... Now you get it. John 14, 7. Even the Spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive. So the Bible calls the spirit, the spirit of truth. It says it in John 14, 17, John 15, 26. But when the comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeded from the father, he shall testify of me. John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you. Oh, I love this. He will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will shew you things. What? That's future, isn't it? God is telling you that the spirit will show you what's going to happen in the future. I was a kid growing up watching these science fiction movies, fascinated by that. Because I'm going, is that how it's going to be? I'm still waiting for the flying cars. Where's the flying cars, Elon Musk? Okay, you got one with a battery in it. Big deal. Make it fly. Then I'll be impressed. Jetsons had flying cars, right? I want a flying car. Under the ground? That's spooky. Yeah. What is he calling it? The groundhog or what? I don't know. Okay. John 17, 17. Now notice this. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So spirit of truth, spirit of truth, spirit of truth. Thy word is truth. They are one. When the spirit comes on you, it gives you truth, doesn't it? Is there any lie mixed in with truth? Can it still be truth? No. Acts 2, 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And what did they do? Did they bark? Did they roll on the floor? Did they laugh uncontrollably? Were they slain? Was anybody on the day of Pentecost slain in the spirit? No. It's not in the Bible anywhere. It's not. That's one of those. Again, that's one of those things that somebody made up. And said, this is our doctrine. And in order to be part of this church, you must, be, you must believe that you are slain in the Spirit when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And yet, no one can show you the verse where anybody does that. Nobody in the Bible ever got slain in the Spirit. Doesn't happen. Slain means murdered. Spirit means you were killed spiritually. And that's not true. So what happened? They spake with other tongues that people understood. Verse uh, 17, it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Not speak in a language nobody knows, not laugh hysterically, not fall on the ground. Acts 2, 18, and all my servants, all my handmaidens, I will pour out of those days in my spirit and they shall prophesy. When the spirit comes, God speaks. 1 Corinthians 12, 8. For to one is given the Spirit, by the Spirit, the word of wisdom. And you're holding that word of wisdom in your lap right now. Did, this, did these words not come to us by way of the Spirit? To another, the word of knowledge. You have the best, you have the best book of knowledge anywhere. Because not only does this book give us 100% perfect, accurate description of what did happen in the past, it's giving you a 100% perfect description of everything that will happen in the future. Um, you, you guys told me your son's going to the same Bible college that I went to, okay? And they mentioned, a t I won't mention a name, but they mentioned a professor who, I didn't know he was still alive, but he's still teaching over there. Well, he taught me the book of Revelation. I took a, get this, this is funny. I got a B plus in Greek. I got a D minus in the book of Revelation. And my mom will tell you I flunked chapel one semester, but we won't talk about that, okay? Imagine that. Anyway, um, he taught out of the book of Revelation, and he said this. The book of Revelation was written at a time when there was a period of literature known as apocalyptic literature. And it was written in a form, a Greek language form called apocalyptic language. And he said there were other such materials written 
at about the same time as John wrote the book of Revelation, and none of them were to be taken literal. They were all to be, they were all metaphors. They were all symbolic. So when you see a beast, John wasn't talking about a literal beast rising up out of the sea. He was talking about the Caesar in Rome. And when he was talking about, you know, him going to war against the saints, that's not a future event. That's an event that has already taken place in the past. And John was writing these things to the saints so that Caesar of Rome wouldn't figure out that he was talking about him and further persecute John. Well, here's what we know about John. We know from history that they tried to kill John and it didn't work. They threw him in oil and he lived through it. So when they figured out they couldn't kill him, they put him in prison, like home arrest, on the Isle of Patmos, and they said, don't bother anybody else. We'll get him out of the way so he can't bother anybody else. But there on the Isle of Patmos is where he wrote the book of Revelation. And they're trying to tell us that John, now John was like 94, 95 years old at this time, and they're trying to tell us that John was afraid to die when I get 95, I'm afraid I'm not going to. <laughs> Amen? So none of that made sense to me. They're telling me that the book of Revelation doesn't mean what it says. It doesn't mean a thousand years. It says a thousand years, but it doesn't mean a thousand years. But what does that say? To, to the word of knowledge by the same spirit, if God said it, it's 100% dead on accurate. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of the healing by the same spirit. All of that comes through the word of God. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but what? How's it written? With the spirit of the living God. Your neighbors are reading the Bible in your life. Your lost family members your saved family members are reading the Bible in your heart. Is it not there? Thy word have I hid where? In my heart. So it's there. And who put it there? The Spirit of God. So when the Spirit of God is in you, what are you full of? Bible verses. And they just come out of your mouth while you're talking to people. Amen. Galatians 3, 2. This only what I learned of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law. So we found out that it was probably an accident, but a church had given out Hebrew roots literature to the Sunday school classes. When they made the pastor aware of it, he pulled the literature. But they were trying to slip in Hebrew roots, law keeping, that you're saved by keeping the law or part of the law, which is a lie. And so Paul said, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? When you received the Holy Spirit, it was done because you believed what? What the preacher said? No, what the word said. You believe Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9 and 10, Ephesians 2.8 and 9, 1 John 1.9, 1, John 3.16. You believed those verses and God saved you that day and put his spirit in you. Ephesians 6.17, take on the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. They are the same. And people say, well, God's not bound by what's in the Bible. Not everything that God does is in the Bible. Well, that contradicts the Bible then. God is telling you that it is. Paul tells Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy, he said that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make thee wise unto salvation. And then he said, for all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that you, Timothy, as the man of God, may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, if God's going to do it, he's going to do it by the book. Uh, this is not in my notes. Turn to Hebrews 10. One of my favorite passages in the Bible. I love Hebrews 10.
Verse 5, wherefore, when he cometh into the world. And I love this. How did Paul know what Jesus said before he came? He said it in heaven. The Holy Spirit told him, sacrifice an offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now think about this. The body of Jesus' first coming was the body that was prepared in the womb of Mary. It grew up as a child, grew into a man, was slain on the cross, and rose again the third day and ascended to the right hand of the Father. But now Jesus is coming back again. And he says again, a body hast thou prepared me. But it's not going to be the body of a little baby in the womb of the Virgin Mary. It's us. It's us, you and I. We are that body that he's preparing right now. Then he said, verse 7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. So Jesus said, when I do it, you can guarantee I've already told the prophets what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do exactly what I told them I was going to do. And they wrote it down. I'm going to do it by the book. Now, I'm sure you're on Facebook, right? And you're scrolling Facebook and you see somebody posted a video where a woman said she had a, a divine revelation from God about COVID-19. You seen any of those? There's probably a hundred thousand of them. And everybody's having, oh, I had a dream of COVID-19. In fact, I had this dream five years ago. Really? Then why didn't you tell us five years ago? We could have shut down China then. Right? I went, I was at a prophecy conference and a guy was, I mean, he was walking the room and I knew what he was doing. He was going around to people all throughout that conference room telling everybody, man, I, God gave me a vision of 9-11 before it happened. God gave, God showed me that whole thing, 9-11. And I knew what he was doing. He was making himself to be some big somewhat among the people in that room. He wanted everybody to think that God gave him special dreams and visions and prophecies that he didn't give everybody else. And I'm going, if you really knew that that was taking place, why weren't you standing at the door of the Twin Towers telling people, don't go in, don't go in. There's going to be a plane hit this building today. Please don't go in. You're a liar. You're a liar. God didn't show you that. God didn't show you that. I'm going to show you this from the Bible. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Look at what the Spirit does. Speaks expressly. That in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Is that happening now? Which is why you can't go to church where you live. Revelation 19, 15. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. That, it, that with it he should smite the nations. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What's he going to do? Blow on them like Benny Hinn? Give them bad breath? What's he going to do? He's going to speak to them. He's going to judge them, cast them into the lake of fire. That's what he's going to do. He's going to destroy them with the brightness of his coming. The spirit of his mouth is his word. 1 John 5, 7. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. Look what the Spirit does. Spirit doesn't bark. Spirit doesn't laugh. Spirit doesn't make you die. The Spirit bears witness. Amen. Speaks. For there are three that bear record. What do they do? Bear record, which means they speak and it's written down. Do you not record? Is there not in your county a recorder of deeds? Why is that important? Brian, why is that important? Recorder of deeds. Proof that you own that car. Proof that you own that property. And Antifa can't have it. Amen? It's not up for steal. It's mine and I'm keeping it. Amen. That's what bearing record does. And that's what the spirit does. Bears record. 
Look at Reve Revelation, these four, what, one, two, three, four, five verses. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Says it again, 229, Revelation 3, 6, Revelation 3, 13, Revelation 3, 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Not what the Spirit laughs, not what the Spirit makes you pass out, not what the Spirit says that you can't understand. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So when the Spirit comes, what does he do? Speaks. And he speaks it so that... It makes it plain upon table so that he, that he may run that readeth it, the Bible says. Paul said, we use plainness of speech and not as Moses. We're talking normal so that everybody can understand the mystery of the kingdom of God. So now, back to our prediction machine. Gary. Crystal balls. Where'd they get this idea of a crystal that you look into and somebody sees? You know, if you do, if you do a Google image search of predicting the future, you're going to get a hundred pictures, stock images of a crystal ball. Isn't that something? That that's so much ingrained into our mindset that when anybody says they can predict the future... The image of that is they look into a crystal ball. Now let me tell you somebody who, who did do that. And I've got him in my notes here in a little bit. His name was John D. John D. was an astrologer, a mathematician, a scientist. But he was the counselor to Queen Elizabeth I. Not Queen Elizabeth II, Queen Elizabeth I. He was her counselor. He told her what, what, what the future was going to And how did he do it? He had a, a scrying bowl. Not crying, scrying, spelled almost the same with an S. And it was a bowl either of water or mercury. Mercury is like a mirror, it's reflective. And, and the scryer would gaze into that reflective surface. And instead of seeing himself, the image would change. The idea was that in that reflective surface they could see future events as if they were happening it was it would be almost like you were watching television think about that so let me unhook the train for a minute but this is related to what we're talking about do you think there are things depicted in tv shows movies commercials of events that have already taken place, but the show came out earlier than what the event showed. Oh, yes. All over the place. There's a video on the internet, TV show, where they laid out the whole COVID pandemic that it came from the Wuhan lab in China, and the cure for it is hydroxychloroquine. Huh? Contagion. Contagion? Okay. I'm thinking of a different, it's a, it's a series TV show. And in this particular episode, the whole, it was a COVID virus, came from the Wuhan lab, and the cure was hydroxychloroquine. It's what? The dead zone. And when did that come out? Somebody looked that up. 2003. So that was 17 years ago. Who wrote that script a person did but who really wrote that script who wrote it a spirit no doubt in my mind see conspiracies don't make sense if you don't believe in spirits if you don't believe in spirit there's no way that men could make all of this work out just like it showed it on a TV show. How many things show up in The Simpsons? Yeah, all of them. Okay, so just, just think about it. You have a scrying bowl and all of a sudden the, it changes into like a TV screen and you view a film or a video of, a, of an event that takes place in the future. 
you write that down, you hand that, or you tell Queen Elizabeth I, Queen, this is, uh, Your Majesty, this is the decision that I think you should make based upon what I see coming in the future. And I'm going to show you from the Bible that that's not some way out of sorts idea that never happens ever. It's all right here. Okay? So Hebrews 11. Let me give you a phrase to look at. Jot this down. Underline this phrase. Seeing afar off. I love that. Hebrews eleven thirteen. Hebrews 11 is the faith hall of fame. Faith. When you have faith, it means that you believe what God said about the past, the present, and the future. Amen. Who believes they're going to heaven one day? Amen. Why do you believe that? The Bible tells me so. Right? Because you believe the Bible is telling you the accurate picture of the future. And you've decided, I've only got two timelines here. I could either spend timeline A in a lake of fire or timeline B in heaven for all eternity. And I can eat all I want and never get fat. So I pick timeline B. Amen? So Hebrews 11 is all about that. These men all believed what God said. Did Noah believe what God said? God told him what was going to happen in the future. Did it happen exactly the way God said? Exactly the way God said. Yep. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. That means that Noah looked into the future with God's eyes. He saw what God showed him of the future and he said, I believe that and God saved him because he believed it. That's simple, amen? That's how you got saved. You believed what God said. Amen. You didn't call God a liar. Okay, God, yeah, I think it's going to rain, but the whole world, I mean, come on. The History Channel, I watch this on the History Channel, God, it's not going to happen that way. It's only going to be limited. So why don't I just move to England because it never rains there. That's a joke. Apparently you don't know much about England. Genesis 22. Abram. Abraham. He, did he not believe what God said concerning Isaac? First thing he believed about Isaac was, out of Isaac, your seed shall be as the stars of heaven and for number. And this is before Isaac has a child. And Isaac's still a young lad. And here God is telling him, offer him up. Uh, Abraham believes that he's going to have to kill Isaac. But he believes God so much that he believes, the Bible tells us that he believed God was going to raise him back from the dead once he killed him. That's how much he believed God. I, I mean, yeah, there were times when I could have killed Matthew. <laughs> Mom, were there times... And she's talking about Melissa. She's not talking about me. She's talking about Melissa. But look at Abraham. Look at this. Then on the third day. How many days was it? The day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And Calvary was 2,000 years after Abraham. It happened on the third day. Just exactly the way this Bible says it. So is a thousand years a thousand years? A thousand years is a thousand years. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And the place that he saw was Golgotha. He would, they went to the exact same place. The place where Abraham offered Isaac was Mount Moriah, the same place where God offered up his only begotten son. And Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they both went to them again. But he saw the place afar off. He looked into the future, and he saw what God was going to do. And he believed that, just like Gary believed the lottery picks. Exodus 20. And all the people saw the thunder. This is where they met God on Mount Sinai. You know, this was on the third day too. It says in Exodus 19 that they, they rested, they washed their clothes, they stayed away from their wives for two days, and on the third day, they approached 
Mount Sinai to meet with God. It happened on the third day, same as Abraham saw it on the third day. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the what? What are we waiting to hear? Trumpet. And the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. They could see it. It's coming in the future. It's happening just the way God said. I can see it afar off. They can see through time. Now turn to 2 Peter. Look at this. Look what happens to you when you don't believe God. When you won't let God work in your life. When you go to a church or a Bible college and they tell you. Now all the translations have mistakes in them. And we don't really have a, we have a Greek text that's always changing. And some of the texts are more reliable. So we took some of the words out of the Bible, like 1 John 5, 7, Acts chapter 8, verse 37, prayer and fasting. They just happened to not be in the other manuscripts, so they took them out. So they told me for three years, you can't trust the, the translation. You can't trust the King James. You have to come up with your own. And I did that, and it was a mess. So look at this, for 2 Peter 1, verse 5. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue. So we have faith and virtue. Um, and to virtue, knowledge. Oh, we have to add beside this. So let's start again. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, temperance. To temperance, patience. The patience, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor what? That's why there's nine things here, unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does it take to know the future? You have to go to Bible college, you have to learn Greek, you have to learn Hebrew, you have to learn all the rules that they give you for interpreting the Bible. No, you just have to let God put faith in you. And then let God put virtue in you. And let God put vir let no let knowledge be in you. Let God give you temperance. Let God teach you patience. Let God teach you godliness. Let God teach you how to be kind to your brothers and your sisters. Let God put in you charity. See, these are gifts of the Spirit, fruits of the Spirit. And if you'll just let God put that in you, you'll see the future. It says, for if these things be in you and bound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see where? can't see the future they won't know what's going to happen and they won't know it when it happens will they because God will send them strong delusion and they'll believe the lie instead of the truth about these things